Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder. It's uh, March 24th, which would be a Sunday, 2013. My email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. And you're watching this on Rob Ryder with three B's, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R on YouTube. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, that a criminal complaint is uh, it's in the jurisdiction of a court of chancery. And uh, I think it's how you seal the deal. And we'll see what we can do with this. So, uh, talking about criminal complaints and how to do a criminal complaint, and then the theory behind where the criminal complaint's going, and how it will get you a judgment, final judgment in your favor, and may put them in jail. That's up to the court to decide. Uh, sorry to ask, but it is coming to the end of the month, and if you can help keep the lights on, the PayPal account is. A-S-H-L-E-Y R-Y-T-L-E-W-S-K-I Ashley Ritluski at gmail.com or uh, Robert Ritluski 10955 14 Mile Road Rockford, Michigan 49341 Very interesting. I get mail to this address now 49341 and when I get my mail on the bottom it has a barcode with the 11 digit zip code in and um, if you look at yours most people you only have nine. I got an eleven. I sent a piece of mail one time and put it on as the address and um, they sent it back here. So that identifies right down to the post office box a particular piece of territory in the unincorporated federal district and we're gonna try to use that to our advantage because not in this video but you know the post office is a powerful place and it is a court. In fact if you go on um, look at all the district courts, U.S. district courts, they're all in a post office building. And when you look them up online it says post office and courthouse, not courthouse and post office. Post office and courthouse. And then Roe told me that in her country um, the post office and courthouse are back-to-back uh, -back in a block and that they're attached. Interesting post office and courthouse and that's where all the district courts seem to have a post office in their building okay so what we're going to try to do is um, we've already found that we can get default judgments against attorneys in foreclosure cases you just you put in a precipice and point out whatever rule they haven't followed and if they don't answer or correct it in 20 days, um, you can get a default judgment against them. Put in a notice, default judgment. Well, now you have a default judgment against the attorney. You know, what do you do with that kind of stuff? So here's an example of one. This is a guy, this is Brother Bob in uh, Florida. And this is the the case information in his case. And if we go back to, you know, here's how long it's been going on, it looks like. I don't know if there's more pages or not, but uh, probably. Uh, November 1st. But back on... Uh, da, 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 da. Miscellaneous document, admission statement, order granting, writ of possession. Okay. When did the first price be going? Okay. On uh, 2 13, February 13th, Bob put in a precipice and rule to file a complaint. Because the uh, attorney firm, now they already had a writ of possession, right? They had never put in a complaint. We went ahead and did it anyways. Put in a precipice. Guess what? Florida doesn't Florida doesn't have any forms for a precipice. Bob made up his own. It's just it looks like a motion, except instead of motion, it says precipice, and you're going to quote a rule that um, they violated. Bob didn't even have a rule number. He just put on there that they failed to file a complaint. And uh, so that was on two thirteen. Then uh, on the March sixth, he. The attorney got a writ of possession up here, but he already had a writ of possession, or order granting writ of possession, and now the, you know, it looks like a, a writ of possession has been put into the record. 
But on the same day, Bob's second precipi, and they spelt it wrong, we don't know if that's on purpose, for judgment of non-pros, because they hadn't answered the original precipi, and so they hadn't followed the rules, and after 20 days, or 21 days maybe it is, you put in a second precipi with a 10-day notice. That in 10 days, if they don't answer or fix whatever the problem is in the record, right, that you're going to get a uh, judgment of non-pros or default judgment, for lack of a better term. So Bob has a default judgment. By this court case, he has a default judgment right now against um, the foreclosing company, even though they got a writ of possession. And uh, he's up here in Michigan, so he's not at the property, but all his locks and stuff are still on, and nobody's changed anything. And, you know, it's kind of a standoff. We've been trying to figure out what to do next. Do we go get a writ of possession ourselves? Right? But doing all that keeps it in the civil side of the court. And it, um, even though it says civil, we were putting it in paperwork specifically to go into the equity court, trying to go into the court of chancery in numerous cases and on the paperwork we get back sometimes it has the name of the court and then it says dash in law right well we don't want to be in the law in, in the in law side we want to be in the in chancery side in equity side well so if a civil case is the law side and um, the same courts administer two forms of law one being um, courts of law and the other ones being courts of equity. If the courts of law are in what is called civil actions, then the courts of equity must be in the one called criminal complaints. Let's find out why that is. So we're going to look at, uh, first of all, you might want to see if you can find your version of this, right? This is the Michigan Penal Code. Michigan Penal Code, Michigan Criminal Code, whatever it is you have. And in here it lists all the different violations that somebody could be um, guilty of. It's got 296 pages and has lots of good, very good ones in it that we could use to our advantage. And uh, you want to see if you can find your criminal procedures for your state, right? This is the criminal procedures. Um, Michigan court rules, criminal procedures. Really, it's the Michigan court rules we're interested in. And you'll see, you know, that this is the general provisions for doing a criminal case, but it says in D that civil rules applicable. The provisions of the rules of civil procedure apply to cases governed by this chapter, except as otherwise provided by rule or statute, when it clearly appears they apply to civil actions only, statute court rule, uh, like a different uh, or a different procedure. So if it doesn't specifically say it's not going to use the civil procedure, the civil procedure is used in a criminal case except where specifically said that it isn't and that'll you know be important in a minute because one of the things it says so in the criminal procedure it doesn't say how to do a summons it just says that a summons might be issued but how a summons is done is listed in the civil procedures and in the civil procedures it says on the filing of a complaint the court clerk shall issue a summons to be served as provided by some other court rules. A separate summons may be issued, yada, yada, yada. Form. A summons must be issued in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. You know, you don't need to go any further. If you're in Michigan and you go look at any kind of summons you've got that you thought was a summons and it doesn't say on it in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, guess what? You never got proper summons. And so they were simulating a legal procedure, right? Because everybody's acting like it was all honky-dory fine, right? But this specifically says it will be in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. It's the only kind of summons there is. I don't know anybody who got a foreclosure hearing that when they got their summons, it said that on there. And then you can see all the other stuff it needs to list. So that's the important thing about the civil procedures as far as the criminal procedures are, is the summons. Any case you've ever been involved in, go look, go look at the summons. You're going to see that um, it doesn't say in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, therefore it was improper summons. And you could 
So you could file a criminal complaint based on that alone in a case that's happened in the past uh, and make the issue of it. So we're going to look at how we're you know, going to try a, a particular case here soon. But uh, this is just all the little things. So what we got here first? So why is it like the Court of Chancery? Well, this is out of a, a book done by a chancellor in Tennessee in like 1919. So it was before 1933 we went to case law. So this is, you know, things may not be quite the same as he says here as it does in the court rules. Very similar, as we'll see. But, you know, I'm going to go with what the court rules say today because this was written before another change in how the courts worked they did in the 30s whenever they went to case law um, because uh, Tennessee had courts of chancery j just like jolly old England and so this was a chancellor explaining the difference between a court of chancery and a court of law and I did some videos on this earlier they're like at the beginning of this year if you just do a uh, um, check my upload date so suits in chancery contrasted with actions at law. In litigation, chancery court is properly termed a suit. Court of law, it's called an action. And when you look at the civil procedures, they call it a civil action. Well, that just made it a court of law. So we don't want to go to a civil action. We want to go to a suit, a lawsuit. The party who institutes a proceeding in a court of law is called the plaintiff. In a court of chancery, he's called the complainant. We're putting in a complaint, and we're talking about doing criminal complaints. I guess it's a court of chancery. In a court of law, the action has begun by filing a bond for cost and suing out a summons. You think about it, when you go put in a civil case, you walk to the window with your complaint or whatever you think it is, they charge you $230. That's the bond for the cost. And then they issue out a complaint or a summons. But they're supposed to be issuing out a summons that says in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. And they're not doing that. And that would put it in the court of law. But in Chancery, the suit is commenced first by filing the bill, or a bill, a bill of complaint, the cost bond not being essential to the beginning of the suit. So you make up your complaint, you take it in, and you file the complaint first. You're not actually filing a complaint in a civil case, and that's why when this uh, court clerk told handcuff John well nobody files a nobody files a complaint she wasn't kidding in a court of law the first pleading is called a declaration chancery uh, is filed before the subpoena issues now a subpoena is in the name of the people of the state of Michigan and so you file a bill the clerk's going to issue a subpoena which is we command the defendant respondent whomever to come into court the other option is they can issue an arrest warrant. It's the only two things they can do once it's been filed. When a criminal complaint's been filed, either a subpoena is issued or a uh, arrest warrant. Uh, indeed, a bill would be correctly phrased, which describe the ground suit in the manner and language of which one unprofessional person would use in writing about them to another. And such was the character and the frame of the bills in the early history of the court. In other words, these are supposed to be written like letters, right? Yeah. Um, everything in law is form driven, for, um, form and procedure driven. In chancery, it's, you know, you were sending this like you, an unprofessional man who had a problem and you were going to send it to the church to have them do something for you. The court of chancery. <laughs> Which had jurisdiction over all the courts. In an action at law, the evidence is mainly given by witness examined orally. In chancery suit, the evidence is contained in depositions taken uh, in vacation. Basically, in chancery, it's the written evidence. And written evidence is so much better than oral evidence because people may lie, cheat, and steal when they, have, when they get under pressure as a witness. But the paper says what the paper says. Does it have a court seal on it? Has it been signed? Was it a proper summons, right? Those, uh, that's the evidence we want to use because now it's going to go to the trier of the fact to look at the facts. Uh, 
the chancery, the issue of fact, are only heard and determined by the chancellor instead of a jury. Yeah, I don't want a, I, I don't want a jury, to be quite honest, because it's not a jury of my peers. I don't know any of those people up there. Right? That could be a you know a stuffed jury made to, for the prosecution, obviously. A court of law regards form, rules, and precedents. Courts of chancery prefers good reason and good conscience. Okay, so these are the differences between the two. Chancery the suits are called a decree. An action at law, property, all property to satisfy judgment is sold by the sheriff under an execution. Um, I guess that would be like a writ. But in a chancery suit, the sales of the property and actually the real property are usually made by the clerk and master and confirmed by the chancellor and the proceeds of the sale are paid out by the clerk and master. So when we go and put in a criminal complaint, we don't need to sue out a writ to the sheriff. The clerk's going to handle it for us. Uh, okay, chancery equitable interests are dealt with and may be sold, transferred, converted in legal estate. Just lots of different little differences. <clears throat> Now this is interesting. This is talking about the difference between an action and a uh, a bill of complaint. A court of law would require four different actions and an injunction from chancery besides to accomplish the same as a bill of complaint. In an action at law, the plaintiff must sue for either property or money. But in, suit in chancery, the complainant may sue for both the property and its money value. In an action at law, you get what the law allows. Chancery, you get what is just and right. The law may be right. Equity is right itself. Again, this is a chancellor of a chancery court. Telling you, you know, everything you need to know about chancery and why that's the court to get it into. And the question, Ben, where the hell are they hiding it? And they're just hiding it, in my opinion, behind criminal complaints. The Declaration and Action of Common Law deals with categorical oracle statements and technical platitudes, right? Numbered paragraphs, one, two, three, four. A bill in the suit of chancery deals with the circumstances of the case in narrative style. Somebody ever wrote a, a complaint before, it's just a letter. It's your bitch letter. And that's the power thing. A declaration is a graven image. The bill is a living being because the bill you're going to swear to under oath. In a declaration, you just say, I declare in a penalty perjury that I have read the foregoing and believe it to be true to the best of my knowledge and sign it. But you don't have an oath administered. Once you have the oath administered, it becomes a bill and it's a living being. Now somebody has to say that you're a liar under oath because you put your complaint under oath. If you can provide probable cause by showing the evidence, they don't have a choice. And uh, how is the suit and chancery commenced? By bill or petition addressed to the chancellor of the division of which it is to be filed and specifying the particular court in which it is to be filed or by motion in open court where the mode of procedure is allowed by law. So if you're in a court of law now, you should, you should be able to motion in open court to have it moved to the chancery side of the court. We don't want to mess with that. We just want to go stay out of their courts. When, when you put the complaint in and it issues a subpoena in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, the prosecutor just became your attorney. He's your attorney general. He's going to prosecute the case. Okay. What else we got here? Uh, before whom bills must be verified. Bills required to be under the oath may be sworn to in the state by before any judge, clerk of the court, and now they say you should take it before the clerk to, to have the oath rendered, um, where an, an injunction is sought, uh, the bill of complaint praying an injunction having been prepared and duly sworn to, as hereafter fully shown, the next step is to present to some chancellor or to some judge of a circuit, criminal or special court. Well, look at that, criminal court, criminal complaint. I think it's chancery and apply for a fiat for an injunction. And what was a fiat? A command or act that will that creates something without or as without further effort. In other words, he signs a piece of paper, puts a seal on something, boom, you just got a fiat. 
and is supposed to be to present it to some chancellor or to some judge of a circuit, criminal, or special court. Now, this is Tennessee, so that's, I guess that's what they called them at one time. The clerk of the master of the court, naming the town where the court is held, in which the bill is to be filed. <coughs> um, oh, the, the, the judge, the chancellor or judge, after reading the bill, will endorse on his it, on it his fiat or his refusal and transmit it in a sealed envelope to the clerk or master of the court in which the bill is to be filed. The fiat is ordinary, ordinarily as follows. To the clerk and master of the chancery court at, give the name, and then, you know, go on with what's going to happen. And uh, you either take a pauper's oath, right, or uh, you have to pay, uh, oh, the cost. Put, it in, put in a security for the cost. So some of those have changed a little bit since 19 whenever. Uh, 1919 in a bill, a chancery practice, a complaint and writing addressed to the chancellor containing the names of the parties to the suit, both complainant and defendant, a statement of the facts which the complainant relies, and allegations which he makes, and an averment that the acts complained are contrary to equity. Uh, averment, which is, I've read the foregoing and believe it to be true. And a prayer for relief and proper process. In other words, give me due process, right? Its office and chancery suit is the same as a declaration in action at law, a liable in a, a liable in a court of amnesty, or an allegation in a spiritual court. Well, all, all anybody ever does is make allegations. The alleged offender, whatever it is, right? You're in a spiritual court. You're just not in the court of chancery. Court of chancery is under Christian rule. It's the it, it's what the court is in the republic. But we find ourselves in a system that has Judeo-Christian beliefs. And really, you can't do that. That's kind of double-minded. You're either a Jew or a Christian. Take a pick. Right? If you're a Christian, you're under the New Testament. If you're a Jew, you're under the Old Testament. But as a Christian, I'm not going to allow you to use the Old Testament against me because my Savior came and he perfected the law, so I didn't have to put up with that shit anymore. Because there's lots of false accusers over there in the Old Testament. They seem to do it all the time. Uh, filing of the bill. After the bill has been duly signed and, if necessary, verified, it must be presented to the clerk of the court, specified in the address. Okay, so then you got to take it to them. And this is kind of what they put at the bottom for your oath. So John Doe, the complainant, in the foregoing bill, makes oath that the statements in his foregoing bill made as of his own knowledge are true, and those made as of information and belief, he believes to be true. Okay, yeah, I can sign that. I'll take an oath to that. Uh, this was larceny. What did I put? Oh, I was saving this for something else. See, they're guilty of larceny. Here's a real easy one. So this is a um, penal code out of Michigan. A person who commits larceny by stealing any of the following property of another person is guilty of a cop crime provided in this section. You steal money, goods, or chattel, bank note, bank bill, bond, promissory note, due bill, bill exchange, other bill, draft, order, certificate, the book of accounts, a deed, a receipt, release, defeasance, writ, process, public record. Right? Any of that stuff, well, you're guilty of larceny, and larceny's got like a five-year and a ten-year prison sentence to it. Because somebody has stole my securities, which are covered by A and B. Because they've, you know, they have me uh, involved in an illegal contract. Why is it illegal? Well, because they never signed the contract. Okay. So here's a kind of an idea for a criminal complaint. Based on what I had read in the rules of Michigan, criminal procedure and Michigan civil procedure, for use against a prior criminal case. Because if it's ever a criminal case, there has to be a sworn complaint filed. 
So the first thing you do is you put it to the court it's going to. And here in Michigan, it's in the circuit court for the county of whatever county it is in Chancery. And we're just going to call it a criminal complaint. And the complainant, John Doe, citizen of the United States of America, son of God, whatever you feel that you want to put there. And your address. And the respondent would be the state of Michigan, Incorporated, its principals, officers, and agents. And its address. <sighs> because the state of Michigan, all caps, is a corporation. And um, they have used, uh, simulated a legal process and charged you with a criminal complaint, maybe put you in jail, maybe took your property, maybe did a lot of things to you, beat the shit out of you. Well, I think they broke a law or two. Well, let's find out. Complaint and believes respondent through its principals, officers, and agents violated the Michigan Penal Code Act of 328 of 1931, here and after the Penal Code, as well as the Constitution of Michigan, 1963, Chapter 11, and the Michigan Court Rules, simulating a legal process as part of a conspiracy to enforce illegal contracts by usurping the authority of public offices and abusing the office's police powers. Right? These, these people are acting like they're officers of the state, but none of them have taken a proper oath. At least the guys pulling over on the side of the road haven't. They're not putting in um, verified complaints. So, Penal Code 752.17c, legal process impersonation, yada yada. A person shall not impersonate, falsely represent himself or herself, or falsely act as a public officer or a public employee and, prayer and prepare, issue, serve, execute, or otherwise act to further the operation of any legal process or unauthorized process that affects or purports to affect a person or affect persons or property. Right, so even if they're a lawful officer, they can't falsely represent that they're issuing you a legal process if it's an unauthorized process. And if they haven't taken an oath, they're not holding the office anyways. It's the complainant's belief that the actors posing as public officers have not signed, sworn, filed for record the oath of public office mandated in the Constitution of Michigan, 1963, what it said. All officers, legislative, executive, and judicial, before entering upon the duties of their respective office, shall take and subscribe the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state, and that I will faithfully, faithfully discharge the duties of the office of, according to the best of my ability. No other oath, affirmation, or any religious test shall be required as qualification for any office or public trust. As far as I'm concerned, if you didn't take an oath of those exact words, you did not take the oath mandated in the Constitution. It didn't say I, state your name, throw that in there, right? It didn't say so help me God at the end. This is the oath you're supposed to take to hold a state office. If that hasn't been sworn, subscribed, filed for record, able to be given a copy of to you, then it didn't happen. It's not on the record. And the guy that just pulled you over doesn't have an oath on file. He's not holding an office. So what are they doing? Well, then they're simulating a legal process, penal code. A person or agent of a person shall not, by personal service, mail or otherwise, serve or cause to be served upon debtor a notice or demand of payment of money on behalf of creditor that is not authorized by state or court in this state and that simulates in form and substance legal process issued out of a court of this state. Jeepers. I think they that's what they've done. It simulates in form and substance legal process issued out of a court in the state because the summons says it needs to say in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. Your summons didn't say that. Your you know your complaint wasn't um wasn't verified. Complaint was subject to simulate a legal process as the defendant in the following fictitious criminal case. So you would now you would put in whatever case you had been involved in before, 
where the court was, the judge, etc. You may even say you've attached a copy for reference, whatever you want to say, as additional evidence. But if you put the case number in, the court and the judge, they can go look it up. It's the complainant's belief that no complaint was signed and sworn to before judicial officer or court clerk violating Michigan Court Rule 6.101 in the criminal procedure where it says a complaint is a written accusation that a named or described person has committed a specified criminal offense. The complaint must be must include the substance of the accusation against the accused and the name of the statutory citation of the offense. The complaint must be signed and sworn to before a judicial officer or court clerk, period. I don't care who you are. If they didn't sign and swear one before the court clerk have it on file, it didn't happen. Now we're going to have to do the same thing so we can put in a criminal complaint. So we're, we are going to go before the court clerk and we are going to take an oath and get the court seal on it and then we may need to go to the prosecutor because prosecutor's approval or posting of security. A complaint may not be filed without the prosecutor's written approval, endorsed on a complaint or attached to it, or unless security for cost is filed with the court. Well, that's what they're doing now on the civil side is they're posting a security for the cost. And so on the on the civil side nobody's taking an oath either so they're not taking an oath and you're not going to find the prosecutor's endorsement on a complaint in fact I was talking to Bob in Arizona about this and he said no on his traffic case this summer uh, he had made an issue of that and we just didn't know what to do with it but it didn't have the signature of the uh, uh, prosecutor on it we just didn't know, really understand how to put a complaint in at that time uh, violation of this MCR by responded and the conspir conspiratorial actions of its principals, officers, agents resulted in the unlawful imprisonment and forfeiture of property of the complainant and the continued violation of the complainant's civil rights to enforce an illegal contract by agents of the respondent with no lawful authority. Respondent is an enemy of the state. Another penal code, conspiracy to commit offense or legal act in a legal manner, penalty. Any person who conspires together with one or more persons to commit an offense prohibited by law or to commit a legal act in an illegal manner is guilty of the crime of conspiracy punishable as provided. And then illegal contracts, certain contracts, <clears throat> every contract agreement understanding or combination declared void and illegal by the first section of this chapter shall be equally void and legal by this state whether made or entered into within or without the state okay so on March 21st two agents um, and this this was for a specific case now March 21st two agents of the respondent uh, continued the respondent's habitual criminal activity by kidnapping the complainant and holding for ransom in a private prison. Upon paying the ransom, complainant was provided yet more evidence of a simulated legal process in the form of, and what they had given him is a, a form that showed that a, it had a spot for the complainant and then a complainant witness, and then a couple more, and complainant witness was checked, not complainant, and it said, that a uh, verified complaint had been filed with the court. So, going to go Monday to see if it's actually been filed, because th this is all just transpired. Going to go Monday to see if they actually filed a complaint. But the important thing is, it didn't say that the complainant put in a complaint. It said a complainant witness. That doesn't cut it. The complainant signs his complaint, period, and puts it under oath. There is no complaint sworn to sign before a judicial officer for their charging instrument, and I, and I am being persecuted by false accusers, slandering complainant's good name in violation of God's law, and now this court is informed and made aware. The actions of the respondents, principals, officers, and agents are manifest, has manifested false accusations upon the complainant and an act of larceny in the name of the respondent, uh, in the part of the respondent. 
So larceny, a person who commits larceny by stealing any of the following property of another person is guilty of a crime provided in the section. Already looked at it. Money, goods, chattels, bank notes, bank bills, bonds. I wonder if they've taken a few bonds from us. Promissory notes, yada, yada, yada. Falsely and maliciously accusing another. <laughs> this is slander. You can use this any time you get a default judgment against them. By precipi, you could put in a criminal complaint for slander. False and maliciously accusing another. It may be called malicious prosecution. Could have lots of names. Here it was under slander. And under slander it said, falsely and maliciously accusing another. Any person who shall falsely and maliciously, by word, writing, sign, or otherwise, accuse, attribute, or impute to another the commission of any crime, felony, misdemeanor, or any infamous or degrading act, or impute or attribute to any female for want of chastity, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Well, somebody brought you into court, put you in the, put it in the paper, right? That you hadn't paid your bills, so they're taking you to court. Complaint and ask this court in chancery for permanent injunctive relief. Judgment against the respondent, restoring complainant's good name, damages, and other remedy or relief this court sees just to order. That's really it. All right, this is just going through the penal code and picking out some things they did. They did slander because um, the act has already happened and if they haven't put in a criminal complaint as we're going to find out in this case they didn't well then they're guilty of slander if you're you know one of the people now that has uh, um, gotten a default judgment by using a precipice put in a criminal complaint charge them with slander and put on there you know that you're uh, title insurance company has a um, a duty to defend your title and they're not there could be a conspiracy between the title insurance company and the title company and the bank <laughs> so you want them to investigate and then John Doe the complainant and the foregoing bill makes oath that the statements in this foregoing bill made as of his own knowledge are true and those made as on information and belief, he believes to be true. I can sign that. I'll go down and take an oath to it. So you would take this. It, when you got all done, hopefully you have a court seal here. Clerk's signature over here someplace. And see, when you, if you went to a notary here in Michigan, and they sealed your document, and you wanted to get a certificate of authority for the notary, you would go to the county clerk's office. And when you do that and they give you a certificate of authority and they put the seal on it, it says it's the it's out of the office of the circuit court. Because the county clerk is the clerk of the circuit court. So you're already in the office of the circuit court clerk. We don't want to go to the 16th Judicial Circuit where they want to take us to. That office there where they put that seal on it is the clerk of the circuit court. That's how it works in Michigan. It, it may be a little different other places, but um, that's how it is. If you can go get a certificate of authority uh, for a notary in your county, whatever office you go to, that's the office of the circuit court clerk or superior court or whatever type of court you have. And once you get the seal on it, then you may need to go take it to the prosecutor and leave it with him. And now he has to make a decision. Is he going to put his endorsement on it and give it back to the clerk? In which case the clerk will then just begin issuing the subpoena. You won't have to do it. The clerk is going to. Or is he going to give it back to you and say that he's not going to prosecute it? which case you would have to go pay the securities yourself and put it in and the clerk would still issue the subpoena. But I think that if we have it under oath and we're pointing out things that are in the penal code and we can point to the evidence that they can easily go get for themselves just by the record of the self-confession of who's ever done what, um, I think that's going to shake them up. I'm all about shaking them up. 
So any, anywho, that's where that stuff is. And uh, this is Bob in Florida, right? He got his back on 3-6, got his price being. Rose comes up next week. Her 20-day window will be up for the price fee. And, and the fact that the judge also ordered the plaintiff to answer the complaint, they haven't done that yet. A gal named Jenny in Florida called me. That was about 10 days ago. And she had put in, she emailed me to say she was going to her first foreclosure hearing the next day. Must have been on a Wednesday because it was Thursday she had court. And, you know, kind of explained what she'd done, anything else she could do. And I said, well, you may want to take your title insurance policy down. And I suggest this to anybody who's in a foreclosure, take your title insurance policy down. I say, hey, judge, I got title insurance. Where's the title company? I want to make them a party to the case, right? Can we do that? Can you, can you help me out, judge? I got title insurance. Right? I, I hired an attorney. I got title insurance. Anyway, she didn't have that. She didn't have to do any of that. So here's what happened. She would just ask him what else she might do. You know, it was the next day. What else are you going to do but get up and go to court? So again, this is the first hearing, and this date has been set up by the bank and their attorneys. And <clears throat> Jenny walks in, and <laughs> there ain't any attorneys for the bank. They didn't want to answer her affirmative defenses that she had put in. And so she asked the judge for a declaratory judgment. And Jed says, now well, we got to give them one more chance. And really, that's how it works, right? Nobody loses the first time. Shouldn't lose the first time, right? You get, you get another chance. But if they don't, it's just like a praesepi, right? You put the praesepi in, they got a chance to 21 days. They didn't put it in, they get one more chance. But now it's 10 days. And so she could easily have a default judgment very very soon but what do you do with the default judgment because even in the civil proceedings the default judgment isn't the end when, when you look at the civil proceedings it, after you get a judgment they have post judgment proceedings right because you really need to go get a declaratory judgment next and then uh, ask for the relief that's one way of doing it the other way is put in a criminal complaint and say that they're guilty of slander because what we really want them to do is go to jail for a little bit because if we get them for the crime right they're gonna lose their bar card they're not gonna be able to do it again to the next guy and so if you really want to help somebody out file a criminal complaint very good that's really all I had and uh, you'll have a great weekend and we'll be on to something else real soon next week see ya